Good morning and welcome to the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts, Powerful Pops presentation, which has been inspired by the Jan Brett exhibit that is now on display here. And behind me, you can see some beautiful examples of some of Jan Brett's 70 different illustrations, original illustrations here. And today we're gonna to focus in on the three snow bears, which has inspired this presentation today. We will be looking at and talking to Jamie and Herb Brambley from the Wilderness Adventure in Kennels in Breezewood, Pennsylvania. Today we're gonna to actually meet and greet some actual real sled dogs and see how Herb is able to um, put the dogs onto the sled and talk about how the sled is created and how he maneuvers around in it as well. So I hope you all enjoy the program. I did put the link here for the Wilderness Adventures Kennel uh, right, right down there, if you see on the screen. If you're interested in finding out more information, you're welcome to um, head over there and um, you know look around their website. They have some really incredible activities going on, uh, but we are gonna get a chance to have one-on-one -on -one time with the dogs and with Herb as he takes us through the life of a dog sled team and get a chance to see um, what these sleds really look like in real life. So I hope you enjoyed the program. If you have questions or comments, go ahead and, and ask in that chat bar there. Um, the video might cut out and then uh, might come right back on, on Herb as he begins to um, tell us all about the sled that he's working on or that he's working with today. So enjoy yourself and I will be here watching and waiting for questions and uh, anything you wanna add to the conversation. Thank you and enjoy. Snow hook. So once I get stopped, I'm going to put that down on the snow and I might step on it to get it to go down into the snow or ice so the dogs can't pull the sled away. Now, when I'm getting off the sled and I have my snow hook in, I try to make sure that I am close enough to the sled that if the dogs pop the snow hook out of the ground, that I can grab the sled or get back on the sled. And the reason for that is, if I lose the sled, I'm going to be walking. And I don't wanna to have to walk 50 or 60 or 100 miles, depending on how far out I am. If I'm on top of the Great Divide out in Montana, okay, I could be 50 miles away from where I can get help. So that's a long way to walk. Hopefully somebody will come along on another dog sled or snowmobile, but you never know. So, uh, getting back to the sleds, uh, these sleds have plastic runners on the bottom of the wooden runners. And the reason for that is actually is to protect the wood. And I can change these in a couple minutes. You take one screw out up front and you slide the plastic off and you slide the new plastic on and put the runner or put the screw back in and then you have a new bottom on your runner here, okay? Um, yes, and I do have two snow hooks because I, if I have more than six dogs, I wanna make sure that my sled's not gonna be going down the trail without me, okay? So what does a musher carry in the sled bag? There are some things that are important to have and if you're doing specific type of races, there are some things that are required. One thing I might have is booties for the dogs. And we put these on their paws and that protects their paws from the abrasiveness of the ice and snow. Snow can be crystalline in, in structure and actually can act like sandpaper and make the paws of the dog sore. And if they're running 50 or 100 miles in a day's time, which they can do, those help protect the paws. They don't keep the paws warm because the paws are going to be warm anyway, but they do protect them. What else might I have? If I'm doing a specific type of race, like an Iditarod qualifier, I'm going to have a vet book. Every time I pull into a checkpoint along a trail, the vet is going to fill a book out on every dog. How are the dogs doing? I might need two of these. Why two? One for each foot. Those shoes. In case I need to break trail in front of the dogs, I put these on my feet and it helps me cover more surface area again, like the toboggan part of the toboggan sled keeps me on top of the snow, okay? 
What else might I have? I have to have one of these. If I'm on an expedition or if I'm in a, in a race, a long race, I have to have a cooker it's to cook my dog food. And the way we do this, let me get some of this stuff out of the way, is actually use this, gas batteries, which is basically just alcohol. And we dump two of these in the bottom of this, just a five gallon bucket with some holes punched in for the air to go in so the fuel burns faster. I'll dump two of these in, not like that. Take the top off, dump them in, and then wait them with a match. And then I put my pot in here with my snow that I need to melt for water. Um, or if I have water, I'm gonna heat the water. Well, why do I have to do that? Because I'm going to be carrying dog food in here and it might be frozen meat, okay? And the frozen meat, I'm gonna heat up and cook for the dogs a little bit uh, and make it nice for them and warm so they feel better and they, they're, they're ready to rest then. Okay, so I'm, I have to have a cooker. I have to have some way to start a fire. Uh, I also have to carry a first aid kit. I need to carry food for myself, dehydrated meal so it's real light. I want to keep my sled as light as possible. Now, how do dogs get their energy? That's a good question. Dogs get energy. Now, is the military going over and they right over our heads? I think I saw the pilot in there. <laughs> They're pretty low. But anyway, getting back to this. Dogs' digestive systems are different than ours. Dogs get most of their energy from fat. So a lot of my dog food that I'm carrying is going to be animal fat, okay, beef fat. And uh, I might be carrying some kibble with me, all right? And I might be carrying some other types of meat like chicken or beaver, or if I'm up in Alaska, I might be carrying moose uh, or salmon or some other type of good protein for the dogs also. But most of their energy, uh, you need to be feeding them fat. That's where that energy is going to come from because it has a lot of carbon in it. Now, we get our energy from carbohydrates. Carb carbohydrates have a lot of carbon also. But the difference there is people and dogs and digestive systems are different. Now, how much energy does a dog burn? during a race uh, or out in the cold when it's below zero in the winter time, they can burn 20,000 calories a day. Okay, 24 big, 24 big max mm -hmm. is basically what they're burning, an equivalent to 24 big max. That's a lot of calories, okay? A lot of calories is what they need. What else might I carry? I might be carrying a sleeping bag because if I have to stop, I might build a fire to stay warm and I might, actually have a tarp in here that I can spread on the snow and lay in my, on my sleeping bag or in my bag. I also might be carrying an ax. Now you might say, oh, you're gonna chop firewood? Possibly, but more than likely, most of the time, I'm going to be using my ax to chop my frozen dog food apart. That's what that's gonna be used mostly for. Okay, now, I know we don't have a lot of time, so let's just talk about Let's just talk about dogs a little bit. Uh, we have three types of dogs here at Wilderness Adventures Kennel. We ha have a Malamute, which you're going to see here in a couple minutes. We also have a Siberian Husky. We have some Siberian Huskies. And we most of our dogs are actually Alaskan Huskies. Now the Malamute and the Siberians can be registered. They are registered breeds, but the Alaskan Husky is not a registered breed. They're actually bred for the job they do, which is pulling. And the old style Alaskan Husky is a little bit different than what you're going to see today. Uh, today's Alaskan Husky has a little bit more hound crossed into them. Uh, dogs like German Short Haired Pointer or Belgian Turverin are actually crossed into the modern day Alaskan Husky. Okay, and that's a, a reason for that is to give them more speed and endurance. And they need the speed because uh, in, Races like the Iditarod up in Alaska, they want to be going fast. Now, in Jan Brett's book, The Three Snow Bears, the dogs look like your typical, what you might call a snow dog, okay? Just like a Siberian Husky or a Malamute. 
they're big and hairy and they have the double coat, the really fine under hair that keeps them warm and then the longer guard hairs on top. And here in this picture, this was taken about uh, 1913 up in Alaska uh, along one of the mail routes. And you can see these dogs, these are your old style Alaskan Husky. And if you go to Alaska and you wanna see the old style Alaskan Husky, go to Denali National Park. They're still breeding them there. And these dogs are close to 100 pounds, but they're pulling a sled here that itself weighed over 100 pounds. And the loads that they're hauling were very heavy. They could be half a ton or more. They might be hauling gold out of the interior of Alaska because there were no less than 30 gold rushes in Alaska. Uh, and they had to get supplies in. So they were hauling a lot of weight on these sleds. These sleds also were made of hardwood, but their wood was a lot heavier and they were 16 feet long. My sleds here are about eight feet long and made a lot lighter. My sleds only weigh about 25 pounds. These sleds weighed 125 to 150 pounds, okay? So the dogs were pulling a lot more weight and not going as fast. They weren't racing. They were getting from point A to point B uh, with the goal in mind of getting there and getting there safely. Okay. Now, let us, oh, let's just talk about voice commands and so forth. When we're going down the trail, how do we steer the sled? Well, part of the time, I might be able to steer the sled by moving my weight, leaning on my one foot, okay, or actually taking both feet and standing on the one runner, and the sled is going to go towards that weight because my weight is going to be causing more friction on this runner. It's going to slow this runner down and allow the other one to easier. So it's going to be turning to the left. Okay, that's one way to steer the sled. Another way is I can actually move the runners a little bit to steer it by leaning on the handlebar and pulling it over to one side or the other side. That's where partly where the flexibility of the sled comes in, not only for uh, giving it some give if you were to hit something, but also in steering, okay? So I can steer the sled with the handlebar. Uh, another way I'm going to steer the sled is by using voice commands, telling the dogs which way to go. How do I do that? Well, if I say G, G E E, that means for the dog to go right. If I say all, H A W, that means for the dogs to go left. If I say, whoa, that means for them to stop. Now, how do we get the dog going? And I know in the movies, a lot of times you see the mushers saying mush. Well, in modern times, we don't use that term mush. I don't know anybody that does. We use the term hike. Okay, hike means to get moving down the trail. Dogs take off. And uh, there are other terms uh, that we might use like on by. If we see a wild animal along the trail, a deer, squirrel, rabbit, or anything, the dog's natural instinct is to go chase it because that's what dogs do. And we tell them on by. And to them, that means, oh, I can't chase it right now. I need to stay on the trail and pull this sled. And that's what they do. Um, so training your dogs to understand those commands and know what they mean is an important part of dog setting. So that's another way. All right, let's look at some dogs. I want to look at some dogs. Come here, Zora. Come here. This is an Alaskan husky. And if you can see her, um, she's not as well haired, although she does have the double coat to stay warm. Uh, her hair is long and fluffy. That's the way the dogs get rid of heat. And because they're burning all these calories when they're running, uh, to get rid of that heat, the, the lighter hair allows them to do that. The Malamutes and the Siberians, you're going to see in long distance race, but if it's warm and it starts to warm the day, or, oh, you're taking a test, okay. Um, they're possibly going to overheat, so you're going to need to rest them more. Uh, they don't have the speed that these dogs do, the Alaskan Husky. <laughs> they ran in, um, 
but they are strong. The Malamutes and the Siberians are strong. So these dogs here, these Alaskan Huskies are a modern day sled dog, leaner, longer legs, shorter hair, built for speed and endurance. Okay, let's see some other dogs. Okay, okay Zora, you're done for now. Take, take a break. Dogs. Okay, I'll just take one. Okay, and they're excited because they know what's going on and they know they're going to be hooked up shortly. So this dog here is a Malamute and notice that she's broad and she has that long fluffy hair, uh, the double coat. Uh, she has bicolored eyes, which is typical for, for Siberians or Malamutes. And she has one blue eye and one brown eye. I don't know if you could see that or not. But she's a really pretty dog and look at that tail. And she's excited and she wants to go. But uh, these are similar to the dogs in the picture that don't go as fast. Now I can, I hook her up with my other dogs, but, and she can keep up with them for a while, but not all day long. Um, I train my dogs that are that doing long distance races to be going 10 miles an hour. And typically these Malamutes are going to be going uh, five or six miles an hour, which is a good bit slower uh, when you're talking about sled dogs. Now, but the Malamute will do twice as much work on half, as much, half the amount of food. That's one really good thing about a Malamute. Whereas the modern day Alaskan Husky uh, actually eats a, a good bit more, maybe even twice. Okay, here we have a Siberian. Can you turn around this way, buddy? No, he can't. <laughs> and um, notice that he's not as broad as the Malamute or as heavy built. Um, and that Malamute is not fat. She's just really well muscled. And the Siberians um, have the long coat again and the big fluffy tail, your typical snow dog. Uh, and the longer hair, they're not as fast as the modern day Alaskan Husky. Again, you're going to see teams of these guys in the Iditarod, but they're probably not ever going to win again, uh, like they did back in the 1970s when that race started, because they're just a, a good bit slower than the Alaskan Husky is today because they don't have the hound bred into them. Okay, are we getting any questions that I need to answer? Are there any questions being written? Or are we good? If, if we're good, maybe we can go down to the gang line where we're going to hook up and take a look at what we have down there and I'll explain the gang line and the tug and all of that. Are we good? We are good. Um, my ability to uh, turn my camera on is, is not available right now. But yes, we are good on questions. You go ahead. And I think we are all looking forward to seeing you um, do that next step. That looks like it's going to be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. How are we fixed for time? We have, we have time. We've got plenty of time. So um, it's about 10... 30 right now, but you take as much time as you need. <laughs> okay, I think in another 15 minutes we'll be ready to go. Uh, but we're going down to uh, the kennel area. And we have actually two types of housing here. We have pens with the dog boxes in, and we also have underground kennels uh, where the dogs are actually have an, an underground housing which is kind of neat because um, it's cool in the summertime underground for them. And it's really warm in the winter. My battery. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> oh, come down here to the gang line, Jamie. And let's take a look at this. Now, the gang line would be hooked to the sled, of course. Here it's hooked to the four wheeler because we don't have any snow. But this center line runs from, would run from my sled all the way down to the, the dogs at the very end in front. And those are called lead dogs. And I can hear the dogs getting excited. 
because they know they're going to be running. But the dogs in front uh, are called lead dogs. Just like in the old days when you had a team of horses, you had your lead horses. The terms that we use for steering the dogs, G, haul, woe, uh, are the same terms that they used back in the old days with the horses. And the terms that we use for the positions on the gang line are the same that they use with horses also. So you have all the way in the front, you have your lead dogs and then you have your swing dogs which is the two dogs behind those the dogs are hooked in pairs one dog on each side uh just like possibly a team of horses and in the back here uh, you have your, your wheel dogs hooked right next to the sled although a sled doesn't have wheels we still call those dogs in the back wheel dogs now we have two lines here. The line in the center, like I said, is the gang line because the whole, the whole gang of dogs is hooked in. These shorter lines are going to be hooked to the back of the harness. Okay, and they're called tug lines. Why are they called tug lines? Because the dogs are tugging on them. And the short line, blue line here, they don't have to be blue, this happens to be, is going to go on the collar and that's called a neck line, okay? because it's hooked to the collar around the neck. So it's easy to remember, easy terms. Gang line, the whole gang of dogs is hooked to it, tug lines and neck lines. And that's for every dog. And these particular types of harnesses that we're using here are, are actually X-back. Why are they called X-back? Because here, they form an X on the back of the dog. Now Zora, Zora, thank you, good dog. Okay, she has an H-back harness on. You can see that the um, webbing forms an H on the back of the dog. This is a different type of harness. And there are several other types. One is a side pull harness. The side pull harness uh, just put the pressure in a little bit of the spot. co-host again and then also we have a question that the question from Monica is can they run free for exercise when they're not pulling a sled uh -oh. what was the, question? the question is can they run free for exercise when they're not pulling the sled absolutely one of the things that we do, especially in the summertime, because it's too hot to hook them up, is we do what's called free runs. And with the free runs, we just let the dogs out of their pen, and I ride the four-wheeler, and then the dogs run ahead of me, and actually they get out of sight, but they're, they stop in one of our top fields, and they wait for me to get there. And I get there, and I shut the four-wheeler off, and they run around me and play for 10 minutes or so, and then as soon as they start the four-wheeler up again, they take off and go down through the woods and do a big loop, and we come back here. So yeah, um, they can run free. And it's one of the most fun things that I get to do with the dog are the free runs. Now this time of year, we can't do it because of hunting season and things like that. And also we like to have the dogs hooked up in the team so they're getting used to working with each other. And another question. <laughs> another question, which I think the dogs are answering, is do they get hyper? <laughs> do, do they get hyper? <laughs> do they get hyper? Uh, right now, they are getting hyper because they know exactly what we're doing here. They were quiet when we came down, and as soon as we start hooking dogs up, they get excited. The poor Coco over there is so excited, she's actually shaking. She wants to be hooked up, and she will. We're going to take her. As a matter of fact, why don't I hook Coco up right now? Yeah, because my battery might run out. So okay. So, I'll show you how to put a harness on real quick. So the head slides through here. Are you getting this? Can you see it? And then we make sure that the axle is back 
and her front legs are up into this part. So there's one front leg. And girl. there's the other front leg, and she's ready to go then. Well, there they go. <laughs> well, that was really wonderful. Um, there are so many things that I learned um, just by uh, watching him hook up the dogs. It surprised me how um, vocal the dogs were while they were while they were getting hooked up. Um, so that was really a lot of fun, and um, I must say, I I didn't know there were so many different types of um, sled dogs as well. So I just wanted to say, I know Herb's not there right now. He's off with his dog sled team. And um, I know Jamie, you're still there. Yep, <laughs> I'm <you>. still here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was so much fun. Um, I'm welcome. going to um, play some of Herb's videos later today. Uh, they will be on our website as well. So you'll get some more highlight footage of Herb traveling with his dogs and um, watching the dogs in action, which I think is the, the best part. Um, and if you really like uh, the idea of the sled dogs, you'll probably see somebody who really likes Jan Brett. So feel free to uh, stop over at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts, where the original illustrations from Jan Brett's book, The Three Snake Bears, are up and will be up until mid-January. Uh, so feel free to get, um, 
some up close and personal time with these original illustrations. Uh, you really can see the details in them as well uh, when you're here in person. So I hope you enjoyed the sled dogs. I know I did. Uh, they were a lot of fun and they were just adorable. I especially liked when uh, the one decided to get a belly rub <laughs> in the middle of the presentation. Laura. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really <She's> cute. <laughs> Um, if there are any more questions, um, feel free to ask them now. This will be recorded and this will be um, available on our website as well. So um, just give us a little time to get it uploaded. Uh, I didn't for the very beginning, so I might do a brief introduction separate from this so you know what we are, um, why we're doing this at the museum in collaboration. And um, Jamie, did you have any more information you wanted to share once again about the organization that you work with? Um, not really. Uh, we're, we're here to educate people about sled dogs and, and how amazing they are. And uh, we're open pretty much year round by appointment. Um, and we do have a you cut out there. Uh, we will also post a link to the, um, the Breezewood facility so you can see uh, where exactly they are and what great stuff they do. Uh, we'll have that all available on our website as well. So if you want to check them out a little bit um, more and uh, see what goes into it as well, you are welcome to do that. So I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. It looks like we have some students uh, looks like maybe there's some students from um, the Washington County Public Schools, possibly um, Central Fulton as well. So again, thank you for stopping by and um, we hope to see you in person at the museum at some point. We are open and um, we will be open, we usually open at 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and uh, we are um, we keep our numbers low so we have a safe social distancing experience. Thank you all so much for coming and I hope you enjoy the program today.